Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Todd Hudson, and uh, we are going to go ahead and get started with our CEO, CFO uh, roundtable discussion uh, this afternoon, at least on the East Coast, it's, a, it's a afternoon. Um, uh, appreciate everybody joining us today. And uh, here is, my name is uh, Todd Hudson, and I am going to be one of the folks leading the discussion. I'm just trying to get my not sure why it's not uh, slides are moving. There we go. All right, got it. Uh, so my name is Todd Hudson, and I'll be leading the discussion along with uh, Paul Siegert th this uh, afternoon. And um, so quick introduction of who I am. I I've been in the uh, the benefits world for about 26 years since 1996 and uh, about 16 years ago after delivering rate increases and reduction in coverage for our clients, I kind of realized it was, uh, there had to be a better way out there. Uh, and I started visiting with some of the brightest minds in the industry and, and found that there was a way to be able to drastically reduce healthcare, uh, create revenue and increase EBITDA for our clients. And essentially what we've done is been able to help um, take some ideas and, and vendor partners and solutions that are generally um, reserved for the, the larger companies, companies with 10, 15, 20,000 employees, and really deliver those solutions down to, uh, uh, to companies that have, you know, 50 to 100 employees and several thousand employees. And so um, I'm an active member of my community, retired rugby player, uh, wrestler back in the day and, and uh, with uh, kids that are 13, 15 and 17, I spent a lot of time in the evenings on week and weekends uh, on the ball field or, or at other uh, activities. So uh, that's who I am. Uh, Paul, would you like to make a quick introduction? Sure, background's a little bit unusual. I was a Russian intelligence analyst for the NSA as my first job, first career. So I'm a nerd officially. I had fun doing that quite a few years back now. I can't believe how far back, actually, uh, and got out of that line of work, ended up going to work for an insurance company to get a more normal schedule, a national insurance company, and uh, that led me to want to become a consultant working on behalf of employers who, in my view, uh, get piled on by the healthcare system to subsidize other payers that don't uh, necessarily carry their fair share, so that's what we get up every day to fight and work on, and we've got Clients in literally every state that are paying half the national average for healthcare for their employees without being on high deductibles, HSA plans, or narrow networks. So that's uh, that's who I am. And when I'm not doing that, I am uh, I've somehow by accident became a, a media personality around that same topic. So I think I was on the news in, in uh, I don't know, 85 markets yesterday talking about the new legislation and Medicare negotiating health uh, drug costs and how that, that may have the unintended consequence of yet again, increasing drug costs for employers. <laughs> so anyway, look forward to sharing anything I can that could be useful today. Great, thank you, Paul, really appreciate it. Um, for, uh, if, if everyone wouldn't mind, we're gonna just do a quick introduction and go around the room, if you will, the virtual room and uh, just make a quick introduction of yourself, your name, your, your company that you work for, and um, maybe you're something unique or what cream is. So I'll start off. My, my favorite ice cream is uh, chocolate chip cookie dough. Uh, so just going around the screen, I'm going to start with uh, Nidish, if you will. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, Nitish uh, Sharma. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's, um, I'm in Washington State at the moment. I'm a resident of California, and um, I've been in this um, industry uh, with serving government agencies for um, over the last two decades, but um, uh, serving as chief financial officer um, and finance director for um, uh, some of the uh, major cities, uh, for example, the city of Davis, California. Uh, my previous uh, employment was with uh, a larger, one of the largest special district in California with uh, Kasimnas, which is a fire and parks district where I served as a chief administrative officer. And some of the things that Todd talked about is uh, benefits and making adjustments and, and ma making sure your agency is um, financially um, sustainable and uh, 
and you're able to keep up with the, uh, providing the same level of benefits. So I've been sort of providing the solution by teaming up with the right consultants, with the right team, because I believe in a working uh, with the right the experts to make things happen. Everybody has their um, has their um, share of uh, knowledge, and then together we can make a difference. Uh, about a few months ago, I actually uh, left the government agency because I saw a huge opportunity to work with uh, a number of cities to um, work on their um, a, a number of uh, um, items, including the long-term financial forecast system, uh, stabilizing the um, you know helping them stabilize the uh, pension uh, mm -hmm. and also retiree health, but uh, but also looking at opportunities how they can further uh, diversify their revenue source and uh, and ensure that they continue to pay their employees. Um, at a rate or reasonable um, uh, compensation, so you have um, reduced the um, the uh, rate resignation or sort of um, you know transition of employees from one uh, agency to another, another, because that's the biggest cost agencies face, and uh, it's also uh, the the human element side of the cost is the morale and stuff. A little bit about uh, um, just one more um, uh, thing. I actually grew up in Fiji, so watching rugby was my big thing. So um, Fiji is really big in rugby sevens, uh, and they won the first Olympic gold medal. So uh, it's very nice to hear that Todd has something that common, but uh, I just wanted to share that. That's great. I love it. Did I hear you correctly that you said you work with uh, large cities uh, as the uh, uh, assisting as a CFO? Did I hear you correctly on that? I was the chief financial officer at City of Davis. Okay. And uh, we had the university over there. So it was uh, 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 basically a full service city, water, sewer. I mean, it's it's anything you name it, the city provides, everything is within right there. That's great. And yes, Dish, I'll tell you, sorry to interrupt, Todd, but those okay. five kids above my head were born at the uh, Sutter Davis. <laughs> oh, wow. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. One of the top 10 place, places in America to have a baby. So my wife, yeah. needed, <laughs> no matter where we live, we had to fly back there, drive back yeah. there. Whatever. That's That's great. Well, thanks for, thanks for sharing, uh, Nidish. Um, I also uh, I think next up would be uh, Troy. Troy, are you uh, able to share your screen and maybe unmute? See, he's throwing it in the message box there. He has to say here. Okay, yeah, just a quick intro. Can everybody see my screen where it says, uh, hi everyone, I'm Troy with access down on my background is in private equity and corporate finance, now focused on growth through acquisitions in dental space. So. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks for sharing. Uh, if, if you'd like to make any additional uh, introduction, Troy, we'd be happy to hear it. Um, also on the call, we have uh, Anoop. Hey, good morning. Uh, this is Anoop. How are you guys? Very good. Very Hi. good. Thanks for joining us. All right. Yeah. All right. So a quick introduction about myself. Uh, uh, I started the company in the year 1999, and we predominantly on the healthcare space. We provide uh, the revenue cycle management services to the physician groups and hospitals. So we do the medical billing, the charges, the payment posting and coding. So typically a BPO services segment where we have uh, an US office operations and uh, we have an offshore center in India. So I, I keep traveling between the US and India. Great. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks for sharing. Uh, is uh, I saw Jim Donnelly on the call there for a bit. Is he still on here? Paul, I think so, yep. All right, Jim, would you? I'd uh, like to share as well. Sure. Um, Jim Donnelly, I'm the uh, president and CEO of a community bank in Pennsylvania. Um, and I've uh, been doing, I'm in that position for about three months. Um, I serve on a couple of boards, uh, one on uh, University of Maine, some board of trustees the state I just moved from. And I uh, served on uh, Northern Lights uh, Board of Trustees, which is a uh, second largest healthcare system in the small state of Maine. And uh, interesting thing about me, I am a certified scuba diver. That's as exciting as I get. <laughs> well, I also noticed, Jim, a couple of things. Uh, number one, you live in Honesdale, Pennsylvania, uh, home of the meteors, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I, uh, I have a, a, a dear college friend of mine that grew up in Honesdale, now lives in Australia, fellow, fellow rugby player of mine, um, really talented rugby player. 
and um, I actually I went to his wedding and stayed at the Settlers Inn in Honesdale, uh, Pennsylvania. Nice. I know the area somewhat well, and I've done some skiing up that way. So welcome to uh, to the call. I, I don't believe there's anybody else. At least I don't see anybody else. Uh, Paul, do you have something you want to mention? I was going to let Jim know. I was going to throw out there to Jim. See, do you know the folks at the Healthcare Purchaser Alliance of Maine? By chance, or is that an org? I'm not sure that the organization you may be aware of, but it's a big uh, I, collection. I am of, aware of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I've had the chance to uh, do some work with them, and uh, just in a kind of a as a consultant uh, around some of the products that they offer, and it's a, a good group. I enjoy getting to know them. So, yeah. Just yeah. At one thing. time. At one time, I was a legislator, so I, I do pay a lot of attention to the policy side of what's going on and uh, right. pay attention to some of the innovative products they've developed and introduced. Great, great. That's yeah. great. Yeah, I saw that you were the minority leader uh, in your state, uh, youngest, if I'm not mistaken, at the time. So kudos to you, Jim. Well, uh, the, moving on through the agenda, thanks for everybody for sharing. I really appreciate that. It's good, it's good to get to know e each other and, and share ideas and, and really utilize this, this event, if you will, to potentially make some new friends and, uh, and share some ideas with each other. So uh, first question I wanted to kind of bring up today really is, is you know, what's keeping you up at night, if you will? Um, uh, you know, I, I heard, um, you know, some folks talking about, you know, quality benefits. I think it was Nittish talking about quality benefits and, 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 and proper salary, if you will, as it relates to recruiting and retaining talent, but that might not be an issue for everyone. So uh, I'll start with Anoop, if you will. Um, and what's keeping you up at this, at this point, uh, Anoop? Yeah, for me, I, because I have a time difference because I am mostly travel and, and, and while operating from India, you understand, right? Because there's a time difference of 12 hours, right? Sure. So I'm, I'm mostly, most of the time, I'm I'm awake till like 2 a.m. in India time. Mm. <laughs> so that keeps me awake most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, my brother-in-law does the same thing. He's here in the U.S., but uh, does a lot of work in, uh, in India as well. And, and uh, he gets up uh, at some odd hours, uh, works some odd hours to be able to get it all done. So uh, how about you, Jim? What's going on, Wayne Bank, uh, up in uh, Northeast Pennsylvania? So I, I'd say uh, things that keep me up at night are uh, if we're in a recession or heading into one uh, and that coupled with inflation is what will that do to credit quality and the ability of uh, my, my customers that are just getting by on the consumer side, um, what would that do for them to be able to kind of pay their bills? And what does that do for uh, the uh, employment situation? Right now, we, we're you know, fully employed. So I agree with uh, the attracting and keeping talent uh, issue. But I worry about when we flip to the other side, when we have an abundance. Um, and in my industry, the mortgage industry has been doing massive layoffs uh, outside of the banks, but in the direct mortgage companies. Um, so just kind of keep an eye out for the talent that shakes loose there. But the things that keep me up at night are inflation, recession, and employment. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks for sharing. And, and uh, you, you, I guess with the uh, the higher interest rates is is probably one of the reasons why the mortgage industry is is uh, tapering off uh, a bit at this point. So hopefully we can get that uh, uh, get that industry moving in the right direction here uh, in, in short order. Um, Natish, uh, how about you? What's keeping you uh, up tonight? Absolutely. I mean, um, I think uh, Jim Donnelly uh, covered it well um, in this business. I mean, uh, there's always uh, what's next. And um, also for us, um, what I'm looking at is uh, the policy decisions made at uh, various um, level, uh, federal government, state government. If we live in California, you know that um, if you hire any employee, it's very expensive. And it's just um, the rules are very um, tight. And for me, what keeps me up is that how to continue uh, making sure that, uh, you know, continue with the cost of living and housing and also uh, ensuring that uh, we provide uh, basic, uh, you know, services that we, we sign up for. So um, part of my challenge, I think, is uh, also trying to make, make sure that clients understand uh, that uh, as government, it's a big business. It's not really 
it's it's really not government and that's people forget that government is the largest business in in the united states right. they have the most money and they they have the most uh, um, outflow but i think sometimes we um, our policies get in the way and also um, if you have elected uh, they get in the way of uh, making decisions that are not so much business decisions so i Pretty sure Jim Donnelly, with uh, being as the youngest legislator, would probably relate to that. But uh, government is a big business, and unfortunately, sometimes the way they move or the decisions they make is more of uh, the next seat or the next um, big job, but not so much about looking for the agency's long-term uh, financial uh, well-being. Great, thank you, thank you for sharing. Hey, yeah, uh, did you did you end up playing rugby while you're in Fiji at all? Uh, no, I because you know all my friends in Fiji and uh, Fijians are like four times 10 times bigger than me so all, all i could do was play flag football i didn't want to get tackled by them so <laughs> <Didn't survive. laughs> yeah. and i i just uh read uh true thanks i appreciate that and i i get the uh the collisions that take place in rugby and football and various other sports uh uh yeah. i can i completely appreciate that i i just checked the uh uh the the chat box and and troy unfortunately is uh he's he's oh. he's on and listening but uh not able to actually participate so i'm going to skip him on that question so uh at this point um we we, we did want to kind of you know we talk about recruiting ret retaining talent and that was uh highlighted in most of the uh, uh the folks on the on the call today as as concerns and and as well as inflation and and the recession and and um you know, just compliance and legislation uh, that affects all of our businesses on a daily basis. But uh, one of the uh, the items that I think is is probably near and dear to most CFOs and CEOs, if you will, is um, you know healthcare and how that line item has continued to go up and up on um, the financial reporting. And and uh, uh, is there a way to actually control that that uh, cost? And uh, is it possible? So uh, Paul and I are going to kind of lead that discussion today, and, and we do want to keep this as fluid. So um, we would encourage each of you, if you you know want to share your screen or, or um, also chime in, we'd have, be happy to, to kind of listen and, and, and have a, a fluid conversation. So I'm going to go ahead and flip to the, uh, to the next slide, if I can. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Paul for a bit, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of go back and forth on this. Yeah, I think this slide, the intention of the next couple of slides is our way of saying we're not practicing on you if we end up having a conversation after this interaction that we're having today. Uh, I think, as I mentioned, I'm in the, I've been somehow accidentally got on a news show because someone shouldn't show up. And there are a lot more exciting things to talk about than how we all pay for health care. But whenever they run out of those things, they seem to call uh, us and we talk about this because it's a it's a constantly moving target and the pace of change has only gotten faster. Uh, right now, we've got in the in the last couple of days, I've been doing quite a few interviews related to the fact that there's another yet another study that's come out that shows employer plans paying more than twice when some one of their members in their health plan goes to a hospital, what a Medicare or Medicaid patient would pay. Mm -hmm. So the distribution of cost is not very equitable uh, throughout the system, and it's and it's worsening. Uh, and, and employer plans are left really or look to as the profit center for, for a really large industry. Uh, and so, and these are actual clients, folks that have taken uh, some of our input on how they structure their, their benefits, not too far from you, uh, or at least where you, you had been there in Davis, Natish. Uh, yeah. I used to spend quite a few, I was every week in City and County San Francisco, we do some of the benefits for some of their employees. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And the... Uh, next slide is we're going to breeze through a couple pretty easy. I don't have to tell you all that uh, COVID made our business worse and the cost that you're facing as an employer worse and more volatile. Uh, and can you see my slide, Paul? Because it's, it's I can see it where it says next slide, but not the current slide. So there you go. There, it looks yeah. like there was a, there you go. my apologies. All good. So, and, and I don't have to tell you all it's inflationary. It's, it's a little bit of a runaway train and it's, a situation where cost goes up and quality goes down consistently every year and faster than inflation mm -hmm. in healthcare inflation usually runs two to 2.5 X CPI. That's a pretty scary thing to put out there right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know how in, in politics, there's that saying, don't let a good crisis crisis go to waste in 
in our business, I, I would I think you can apply that to insurance companies. I'm, I would be very surprised if insurance companies don't take significant advantage of the situation in terms of inflation when they issue renewals. Different states have to issue them with different uh, lead times. California has some of the largest lead times, mm -hmm. and we're already seeing a pretty uh, significant increase coming toward employers right now. 12 points is the average that we're seeing. And a, and a little less willingness on the part of insurers to, to walk that back. So uh, anyway, there's a few big problems that we wanted to help solve when we got started down this road. First is there's lots of misaligned interests. Everybody in the normally normal delivery method or in the normal way that you purchase uh, health coverage for your population does better when you pay more. It's not a great way to build incentives. Second problem is that uh, the Affordable Care Act included some things that have resulted in unintended consequences. An example of that would be the medical loss ratio rule, where, where we told insurers, so long as they spend 80 cents of every dollar they took in a premium on a claim, they could keep 20 cents. We actually put them in a cost plus arrangement with uh, no max, in a sense, if you are, are familiar with how construction contracts work. They do better when claims costs go up. And when you look at what's happened in the last 12 years, deductibles have gone up 87%, premiums more than that for many employers, depending on, on segment and size. Uh, the one we don't talk enough about, I think, is the fact that 100 million Americans carry a carry medical debt, and it's a significant amount. It's $198 billion. And the answer so far that we have to that is to change how we report it on credit bureaus, not to actually address the real problem. <laughs> Uh, so, which is rising out of pocket costs, the shift of costs to employers or employees rather and their families, along with rising premiums and so on. We'll solve some of that in a minute. It can be solved. There is good news. It's not all depressing today. Uh, and then the third problem is that at time of renewal, if you're in a retail plan, you don't get great options from the normal marketplace. And a retail plan to me can be any funding arrangement. It could be fully insured, partially self-funded, level funded, in a medical captive, in a consortium, fully self-funded. All of these arrangements can be retail. That is a classification that we simply came up with on our own to identify a plan that's being overcharged for services where transactions cost more than they need to, mm -hmm. where waste can be eliminated without reducing quality. Uh, and I'll show you a few examples of that in a moment. Uh, we solved the problems by building custom health plans. We didn't invent this stuff. We're smart. I can speak Russian and, <laughs> and all of that, but that doesn't mean I'm smart enough to fix healthcare. Uh, there's a guy named Tom Emmerich who ran Walmart's plan for about 15 years. Whether we ever get the chance to, to spend time together again or not, I would encourage everyone on this call to find a couple of books that he wrote, E-M-E-R-I-C-K, Tom Emmerich. He ran Walmart's plan for quite some time. He then uh, became a consultant for other employers. He then taught other consultants. And we, Todd and I both had the good fortune of being part of that group. I had a little bit of a unique experience in that I worked for one of the insurance companies that had some of Walmart's business when he was there. He basically came to the industry and said, look, this game where we give you more money every year and get less coverage in return for our people is not working that well. And we don't have the level of transparency we need to verify if we're getting treated fairly. He was in a self-funded plan at the time. So it really... Uh, it was more than claims data that he was asking for. As a result of that, there is a very positive movement where there's a growing number of second and third layer vendors, all the small vendors that operate inside of your health plan that have agreed to operate more transparently. So our whole approach to this problem is to engage those same vendors when we build solutions for our clients. It doesn't mean when I say vendors, I'm going to define that a little bit. I'm not saying that you have to give up the Blues, United, Cygnus, Aetna, and Humanas of the world that we're all familiar with. Everybody wants one of those logos on their card. All of our clients have that. It's the layer, it's the vendors that they outsource functions to. They're really third-party administrators that insource and outsource a lot of functions. And to clean this thing up is, is quite a detailed project where you have to look at each little cost driver that stacks up to become your premium at the end of the day and make sure we have the best in class vendors involved, best in class contracting terms, all of that. That's where we do our work. And I'll show you a few examples of that here in a second. The uh, next slide gets into how we do what we do. What we end up doing is looking at two buckets of money that exist in every health plan, a small bucket of fixed costs. So reinsurance, administration, claims management, and so on. The 20 cents on a dollar or so that pay those kind of uh, expenses. There's usually opportunity there if you're in a retail plan. 
you can pick up three, four, five points of savings. It's the small opportunity, usually not enough to move the needle to justify big cultural change. It's in the other bucket, the claims, where 80 cents on a dollar live, where most of the profit in our industry is actually hidden and most of the waste exists. And in our world, we end up focusing on drugs, hospitals, and surgeries and cleaning that up. And in the process, improving the qualitative experience that your people have. So I'll give you a few examples, one in each. When it comes to drugs, which has become a, a big focus of mine, you have a normal supply chain like you'd be familiar with. Manufacturers make drugs, wholesalers, pharmacies. And then you have pharmacy benefit managers off to the side who are there to perform three functions. They manage your formulary. So yes, the drugs can go on the list. Here's what the copay is. They adjudicate and pay drug claims, and they're supposed to negotiate drug pricing on behalf of your plan to get the lowest possible pricing for the plan. And that is where we've gotten the most off track. They used to perform those three functions. You go back 15 years, they would earn a dollar when each time a drug was dispensed to someone in your organization. Fast forward to today, all these buckets on the screen that Todd's sharing represent different fees that they've added, even though their services have remained the same. We're up to, we should update this slide now. They're up to 41 different fees that they can add to the cost of a prescription transaction. And when you break it all down in simple terms or step back and look at it from the big view, it creates a 2X impact on the cost of drugs in retail health plans. Insulin is a really good example of that. Humalog is the most commonly prescribed insulin in this country. Eli Lilly makes the drug, it gets wholesale, it shows up at a pharmacy. Someone in your group goes to a pharmacy and gets a box of these insulin pens. If you have a retail plan, your plan is paying around $550 for that box of pens. 330 of it is in these buckets. Being added by the organization who's tasked with, as one of their three jobs, getting the lowest cost possible for the plan. So clearly off track there. The good news is it's already an outsourced function in virtually every plan and you can outsource it to a better vendor partner. There are 300 pharmacy benefit managers in this country. Part of what we do is keep our eyes on that group and do constant analysis around that. It's a moving target, but our job is to know which are the most transparent and fair in their business practices. And there's a small subset that are willing to go back to the original revenue model for their, for their business, where there's, they have a sole source of revenue as a per script fee. What you're seeing on the screen is first year reduction in drug spin in a couple of groups where we made that adjustment. And it was not only good news for the plan where the plan saw a reduction in 30, 40, 50% in that cost driver, which represents 15 to 20% of their total plan cost. If you were to back it out, they also have are able to bring good news to their employees and their families. Very commonly, along with this level of savings at the plan level, you're able to eliminate co-pays entirely for high dollar brand and specialty drugs for the people in the plan. So really good news for them as well. Culturally, that's about the best thing you can do in a health plan because the most frequent kind of claim in a plan is a drug claim. It affects the most people. So, uh, and it's the most inflationary part of what we do. So uh, it, it means that trend line into the future for your plan is flattening out. You've taken a ton of volatility out of your plan. Hospitals are next. Uh, you've probably seen it in and out of the media. And I think, uh, Natish, you you have a, and shoot, J Jim too, in your legislative background, have a view on some of the stuff I'm about to talk, talk about, or have seen it from the other side of the fence. Oftentimes when a law gets passed or a rule gets made with good intentions in the implementation, <laughs> it gets a little bit gutted. And you look at this hospital transparency rule, that was part of the original Affordable Care Act. 12 years ago, it should have gone into effect. And I think it was a really good part of that law. We need more transparency. They fought it in the courts for 11 years, finally lost, had to start being uh, transparent, supposedly, around their pricing January 1 of last year. The fine, however, and implementation was assigned as $300 a day, which is why I've thrown up this high-level accounting for a mid-sized hospital, actually, in the Bay Area. And mm -hmm. they ran over $11 billion through that hospital. So yeah. ask me. <laughs> I've asked, we have a lot of hospital clients, and I've asked hospital CFOs many times, for my own entertainment, frankly. Why aren't you in compliance with the transparency rule? And my favorite answer from the head of a hospital association of one of the states in this country, uh, who will remain nameless, he said, why, how, why would we? Uh, the, the fine isn't even a rounding error for us. It's, it's a budget dust, we would call that. So they increased the fine. Now the fine is a max of $2 million a year. 
that is still insignificant when you're talking yeah. about these kinds of numbers. So we have today, as we all sit here on this call together, the largest hospital chain in this country is, is at 0% compliance across all of their locations. If you take the three largest hospital chains and combine their compliance rate at 0.5%, they're not eager to reveal, to, to be subject to the free market forces, frankly. And they're not eager to reveal to employer plans, especially the fact that they are paying, they are carrying a lot of weight in the system. It's not distributed very evenly. And it's not uncommon that an employer plan will pay three and a half, even 10, 11, 12 times what other payers will pay when, when someone in their group shows up at a hospital. The next slide shows how we can solve for that at a procedure level. It's really done through better contracting and better claims management. Uh, in fact, to save a little time and allow us to maybe have a little more interaction and questions at the end, why don't we just jump to the surgeries because they're handled in the same way, Todd, as you know. Uh, I'm a living example of how you can get better results for everyone in the process, everyone involved in the transaction, including the provider in the surgeries. At 43, I figured I should buy the biggest kettlebell they sell and teach myself how to use it in the garage. So naturally, I got a hernia. <laughs> and uh, so then I had to get it repaired. And as part of our plan, since we have a plan like I'm describing, I had the option of connecting with a nurse to guide me through the system. This used to be part of all health plans. Before 15 years ago, they, they staffed one nurse for every 5,000 members in a health plan to guide you through the system when something big came along. They now staff in retail plans, one at 50,000, because it's it's really just a box that's getting checked. They don't provide the same level of, of service at those moments as they used to. In the plans that we build, we bring that back because it, it's so powerful. And I'll, I'll describe how. I was able to talk to a nurse. I'm, I'm coming to you today from Nashville, although my office is in California. With COVID, I went virtual and moved to Nashville. But the, the uh, nurse was able to tell me, here are the three top surgeons in Nashville. If you use one of them, we've already pre-negotiated uh, better contracting, better rates, and you'll have no share of cost. So it was great news for me as a member Great news for my health plan because if you can uh, if you can see the tiny numbers on my screen, the hernias there's a hernia example four down. Our plan paid less than five thousand dollars for my hernia repair, and the provider was happy because he didn't get strung out for two three months by an insurance company waiting to get paid and he didn't have to chase me for my share of cost. He got paid in full week of service, so it was really a better transaction for all parties, uh, and that's the kind of thing you can do with scheduled procedures that occur in, in hospital or outpatient surgery centers, that kind of thing. So we're getting toward the kind of home plate on this. A normal next step uh, for us is if, if we end up having another conversation after this with, with anyone on today would be to do some high level modeling with some basic data points. We can conservatively project what's possible if we were to apply these concepts to your plan. This was a small software firm uh, also in the Bay Area, as it turns out. They had a retail plan with Aetna and still have Aetna. Why change if you don't have to? But we did some of the things that I talked about today and their plan is now richer. The experience for their employees has improved and they're on track to put more than that bottom right number back in their firm in a five-year run. So more than $12 million. And for a small firm, that was a big, uh, a big win. Uh, and that's it. I'm going to kind of leave it there, see what what comments or questions might come up and see where we take it from here. I think you described it well, Paul. I mean, um, um, when I, what some of the things you described is I've been experiencing on the, uh, on the receiving end. So, you know, and the, um, I know you mentioned the cost, um, the employees about 15,000 or so. You know, some of the employees that we have is a Cadillac plan. It costs $24,000 each employee. Right. And, uh, it gets very expensive, but then you want to keep up with the healthcare and especially in California. Right. And if you're not able to negotiate that price, you're not going to be able to uh, make adjustments. I mean, for your agency and uh, the biggest player in California is, is CalPERS, as you know. Right. And very easy to... Uh, blame CalPERS for that, but you do have an option as an agency to negotiate that and have the right people do the work for you. And right. that's the opportunity that I took when uh, I was in, uh, in the uh, 
with the fire and parks district because a very huge part of the healthcare costs is, is with fire department. Right. How do you continue to pay your, um, make sure your firefighters are healthy at the same time they have the benefits because you know they 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 get exposed to a lot of stuff so right i agree with that that concept but you know just uh i think there's options for agencies but uh if you want to be bold enough to take those opportunities and and be able to do what you just described and be able to reduce that be able to you know a lot of times you just sit back and they just go with the flow and it right. you know it's tied as mandatory costs mandatory costs but really is it mandatory costs or do you have options Right. I, I agree with you. It's Todd and I talk about pushing the easy button a lot. Yeah. And there's a lot of organizations that do that. Uh, and then there are those that stand out and have done what you describe, where mm -hmm. they really engage with it. Mm -hmm. And they've been able to have some, we've been able to observe or be a part of, at least as a consultant on the, on those teams, creating some fun conversations between those uh, agencies and the unions that they have mm -hmm. to interact with. I'm thinking of a, a county in particular where, of course, they, they had some very strict rules around what they would do to share increases in cost. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any expectation, though, that it would ever go down. And when it went down, then they had to come back to the table and say, how do we share this? <laughs> how do we share this extra money now that, yeah. that's shown up, which is a great, a mm -hmm. great situation to be in. Yeah. And it can be done. It can be, and the money gets invested back in the community, as um, as you know, uh, exactly. back to the citizens. So it's not like somebody's pocketing that. It's just, right. I think, taking that approach. So I do appreciate that uh, this uh, presentation and the discussion because, on the receiving end, I guess on the other side, on the client side, um, that's definitely an opportunity. And uh, a lot of CFOs um, or CEOs, they get caught up. They get caught with the. Uh, you know, um, with uh, electeds or get caught with the next big thing that don't land anywhere. But these are the real things that can make a difference. Right, exactly right, I agree. Sure, I know you're you're, uh, you're, you're muted and, and are just utilizing the chat box, but if you have anything you'd like to share, uh, we'd be happy to hear it. Just go ahead and type that in the chat, chat box. Uh, Jim, I see that you're driving. Um, uh, drive safe, of course. Uh, do, you, do you have anything you'd like to, any questions or comments or? or uh, the seatbelt's uh, coming off. Seatbelt's off, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've arrived. No, I, uh, I, I think from the, the healthcare provider side, you know, the push over to uh, the additional cost to the private pays is because the, uh, like we said, the government negotiated contract pays 60 percent if you're lucky 50 percent right. of the cost so that cost has to shift somewhere right. and if those hospitals are for-profit hospitals their investors want to return if they're not for profit hospitals they still need to invest in technology um, paying their people um, and staying current and so you know the, i think uh, the initial presentation from paul kind of hit a lot of uh, i can see why you're on 89 and growing uh, venues because uh, you had a very quick and uh, a nice way of kind of rounding it up, punching it through, uh, making the point. So I, I think the conversation's on point and it makes a lot of sense. Great. Great. Thanks for sharing, Jim. Um, Troy just uh, uh, made a note uh, on the uh, chat box uh, asking Paul, how does the uh, this layer in with current uh, existing broker carrier relationship. So great question, Troy. We get that a lot. Yeah. yeah. I say I've learned along the way there are three P's to any any business relationship or or potential one anyway, product, price, and politics. And the most powerful is politics. Uh, so <laughs> and it's also <laughs> the one that I have the least visibility on. <laughs> so I, I rely on others that are involved in the in the in the transaction or potential transaction to guide us on that. But we, in response to that, uh, we have come up with a lot of options there because our goal is to be a positive force in this big problem and be part of the solution of this big problem that we all face together in the way that we pay for healthcare. And that doesn't mean in the traditional model of, of working with an employer in this area, it's make me the broker or nothing. And that's kind of the routine that you often will hear. Give me your, your business and then I'll get to work. Our goal is to deliver value and get compensated fairly for doing that and make it possible to do that, even if politics preclude 
a, a significant change or, or whatever. So we can, all of our relationships start as a consulting relationship. And that's done uh, off to the side of what an organization has going on currently. The intent there was to create a pathway for an organization to explore this without interrupting the coverage they provide their people currently or the relationships that they have to provide that coverage. And then uh, that, so that's a project and that's usually a 60 day or so project. At the end of that project, we create options or we provide options where we can continue to be involved or not. Uh, we can simply charge a fee for a project that's reasonable and provide significant cost reductions to the organization without reducing quality or access to care. And then another uh, option is to be kept on as an ongoing consultant in addition to the current team. And then, of course, there are cases, we, we do have thousands of cases now where we are the broker on those uh, accounts in a more traditional fashion. But, but that's the short answer is it's up to you. And our, our goal is to give you options so that one of them might work where we could deliver value. Great question, Troy. Appreciate that. Jim, it looked like you uh, you left and came back. Wasn't sure if you had any additional questions or comments for the team. No, I I think uh, I think we're doing well. Okay. Uh, how about you, Nidish? Any any follow up questions to that or? or... Uh, no, I think it's just being. Um... I think being as a consultant now myself is like teaming up with the right team, you know, like uh, that's what um, recently I teamed up with a pension and OPEB, uh, a retiree health software company, GovInvest, and basically, you know, over a thousand clients and, um, and their goal is, as a software company, they are projecting the uh, pension cost and, and retiree health costs for agencies over the next uh, decade or so. And it really helps them to stabilize the budget and impacts of labor costing, and also how to continue to make adjustments in the uh, in in areas that uh, are primarily the big part of your budget. If you look at any government agency, uh, almost 70, 60 to seventy percent of the budget is um, is uh, personnel, is is your people. And I think sometimes they, you know, and government get caught with the other fifteen percent or ten percent. But really, that doesn't even make a difference because most of those are ongoing costs. So I think uh, just knowing the cost component and as a consultant, like teaming up with the right opportunities. So for me, it was very helpful to hear this because if I'm working with a client, I'm working with a client in Washington. So I'll be able to say, hey, let me call Todd and see what um, um, and um, and Pauls to see what opportunities we have. So this is how we help each other out. So uh, and and our goal is that, of course, that is um, everything is tied, you know, um, when you look at the um, the net impact, it really saves agency money. It doesn't cost them money. But they, I think the initial outlay of like, oh, it's going to be expensive. I think that's what kind of um, puts a roadblock or barrier, but it's going through that barrier to help them understand what is the long-term vision and what is the long-term sustainability of programs and benefits and things like that. Yeah, agreed. Couldn't agree more. And, I, and, uh, and as you mentioned, it's, it's all about relationships and and networking and, and knowing who to reach out to when when a, a need arises. So we're, we'd welcome that uh, uh, to be able to help you in, in any way possible. Uh, yes. And of course, anybody on the call here today as well. I mean, that's sort of the goal is some networking to be able to uh, provide some resources to folks, uh, some open dialogue, and um, and hopefully ultimately helping out uh, folks across the country and, and drastically reducing their healthcare costs. Uh, mm -hmm while enhancing coverage. And I think that's one of the things that really gets, gets uh, forgotten here is, is uh, we're, you know, we're, we're making the coverage better while we're reducing cost, And it's such mm -hmm. a nice message for the members at the end of the day, as well as, uh, you know, the C-suite. So mm -hmm. um, one, one thing you missed, Jim, and I'll, I'll just kind of take, uh, I just want, when you stepped away for a moment, uh, there was a question that Troy brought up about, um, how, you know, how does all of this come into play with current broker relationships and carriers and so forth? And, and essentially what Paul mentioned is, is really we, 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 we provide options. Uh, our goal is really not to disrupt anything you have currently um, working at this point, uh, work off to the side as a project base uh, and come back with value and, and real life 
solutions that are able to to be delivered, whether you utilize our team to to uh, to make that the delivery or 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 some other manner, we're we're there to uh, uh, to really just kind of focus on making sure that you're getting the best possible solution for your team on not only year one but year two and three and beyond. So I uh, just wanted to kind of clarify that was one one question that came up while you stepped away for a moment. Yep. Thank I thank you. I caught part of that before I had to jump off. Uh, when I left the vehicle, it dropped uh, on my way in. But um, I did catch that in the places that uh, you and Paul had touched on that you could negotiate and do a little um, better than just the standard format. Um, makes sense. Uh, that, that that's where the variable costs are, and if there is additional lumping on a profit, then uh, this then there's a place to negotiate. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I have us at a quarter of the hour. Um, we, we budgeted an hour, but uh, I don't want to cut us short in any way, but uh, I, I'm certain everybody would love to have 12, 13 minutes left, uh, back on your day, if you will. <laughs> yeah, uh, I get lunch today. <laughs> <laughs> is, there, uh, is there any uh, last minute questions or, or comments that anybody wants to make before we wrap things up? And and. I just will make one quick comment is uh, the presentation today, the, the, the roundtable discussion uh, has been recorded uh, and I'll be forwarding that to, uh, to, the, to the folks who joined today uh, at some point later on this afternoon. So you should have a copy of it. Uh, if anyone has any interest in learning a little bit more, just having another side conversation or just discussing a little bit further, we'd be happy to, to, to do so and set up a little one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation and see how this could benefit either you or your organization or you know in addition and in your case you know some of the companies that you're working with so uh, we'd be happy to to have another conversation just determine how, how we could possibly fit into that um, future if you will absolutely i would also maybe if um if um allowed maybe just post it on linkedin because um you know, it also gets the uh, the word out there to just, uh, you know, taking time out to, to, to participate in this stuff is just, it grows the network and then more and more people may be engaged in this stuff because these are real conversations. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I know Paul does as well. Absolutely. And uh, so nice to meet uh, Mr. Donnelly too. I will add him on LinkedIn because, uh, you know, he has a lot of uh, insights too. And I really appreciate to get to know you. I think for me, the big part of this call is to get to know some, uh, you and, and the content is great, but people uh, is what matters. So I really appreciate uh, all of you. Agreed. I couldn't agree more. And, and I wish Troy was able to participate a little bit more, but he, he said he had to be a fly on the wall today and that's fine too. And it looks like we, we lost uh, a new uh, about halfway through the conversation, so I'll make sure he gets uh, a copy of it. And and uh, yes, let's all connect uh, via LinkedIn and we continue this conversation. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, day, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.